As actors, we get to rely on scripts to tell us what to do. Like when to slap someone across the face and when to let someone slap you. But we don't need a script to tell us to help someone in need. The SAG Foundation was founded to do just that, to help performers with life's unscripted moments and to give back to our communities. Over the past decade, the SAG Foundation has given millions in financial and medical assistance to SAG after performers and their families. Last year, more than 25,000 union performers attended over 500 SAG Foundation Q&As, seminars, and workshops. And SAG Foundation book pals read to over 60,000 children in schools every month nationwide. Do you know how much SAG After members pay for all these resources and programs? Zero. Zero. Zilch. Nada. Do you know how much of our union dues go to the SAG Foundation? Zero. 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 The SAG Foundation is a nonprofit that relies solely on donations, so it is vital that those who are able to help give what they can. And you've been giving since the SAG Foundation was founded in 1985. I love 1985. Out of Africa. The Color Purple. The Goonies. The Cosby Show. Family Ties. The Golden Girls. What? So many truly fantastic performances since then. We have a wonderful history and a beautiful tradition of being there for one another. If you need help, it's here for you. And if you can help, please give. Like every great production, we are at our best when we all act together. 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 So please, act now. Are we there? How fun is that? You like that? Good times. Um, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for those viewing on the live stream. My name is Dennis Baker. I'm the Life Raft Program Director. We so appreciate you being here and watching. Um, a couple things. We are social media conscious, and we're asking you to do a couple things on social media that would help us out. We want to hear from you, so that means at the end of the event, um, we would love for you to tweet maybe one thing that you learned from tonight or one quote that you really appreciated from the panel to get the word out about the SAC Foundation. So simply, if you're on Twitter, go ahead and tweet that and include at SAC Foundation. We'd really love to know and hear what you guys are getting out from the panels, and Twitter is a great place to share that information. Also on YouTube, youtube.com slash SAC Foundation. There's over four and a half years of archived life raft events, as well as conversation Q&As and two hour Q&As. We ask that you not only watch and share, but also subscribe. We're at about a 5,000. When we get to that 10,000 mark, YouTube starts paying attention to us and we can even get it out to more people. So if everyone here and then every one of your friends starts subscribing and watching, YouTube will start paying attention and we can get the word out, get it advertised a little bit better. So we need your guys' help with that. YouTube.com slash SAG Foundation. Just basically do a search for SAG Foundation at YouTube and that'll be the way to do it. Super excited for tonight. Couple things that the live stream and you guys need to know is this is a one panel discussion of a greater discussion. We're doing a five part series on indie film producing. Part one is financing. That's actually gonna happen in New York. They're unfortunately not gonna live stream but they will record it and hear me when I say that because that'll be important in a minute. We did pre-production last month. That is on the YouTube page now that you can go check out if you haven't done so. Doing production tonight. Post-production will be next month. And then distribution will be in New York and recorded. And once those events are recorded, we will all get them on the YouTube page. So you have five parts to watch in whatever order you want to be able to get that information. Another reason to check out the YouTube page. So know that tonight is just about the production element of what the producers go through once they're in production. So any questions about financing, any questions about distribution, that's not for tonight, that's a different discussion. So just focus your questions and the conversation will be around producers during production. Make sense? And we'll get all that information up for you at a later date. Um, Wonderful moderator. She's going through the series with us. She was here for pre-production and we'll go through today, tonight and post-production. Kelly Thomas, producer in residence at Film Independent. Give her a hand. Thank you, Dennis. Um, it's so nice to be back and see your happy faces. Um, this is such a pleasure to moderate this, this series. And um, a little bit about Film Independent. It is a nonprofit arts organization. Its two flagship events are the LA Film Festival and the Independent Spirit Awards, which I'm sure you've heard of. Um, we also have year-round programs. So we have labs and workshops for uh, fellows. We have membership um, opportunities, seminars, and 
mixers and all that kind of stuff. So I encourage you to check it out. In my capacity there, I mentor filmmakers, I help run the labs, and I have produced content for them. I did some branded entertainment for Vanity Fair and Lincoln Motors last summer. So check it out. Um, I'm very happy tonight to introduce our panelists. Um, I'll, I'll let them talk, uh, give you their background. So first we have Lucy Mukherjee Brown, Jennifer Durbin, Matthew Sue, and later joining us will be Sebastian Duncan. Hi, um, I'm Lucy. I am a development executive and a producer, and I've been doing this crazy business for um, 11 years now. I uh, started out in publishing as an editor advising authors on script notes and then, I mean, notes on their novels, excuse me, and then transitioned into um, feature film development advising um, on the uh, development of scripts and then got into physical production as well. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm really happy to be here tonight. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I've been producing for independently uh, it, with my own company for the last eight years. Um, I have a partner, Cora Olson, who I produce with. Our company is called Present Pictures. We've made about six films now, uh, feature films. Our newest film is a movie called Preservation, which is going to play at the Tribeca Film Festival in a, in a couple weeks. And, oh, and um, a lot of the films that we've produced actually have been uh, directed by actors who are, you know, multi-hyphenates and, and starting to uh, branch out beyond just acting. So uh, I feel like I have some things to share with you that could be helpful. My name is Matthew Shu. Uh, I'm also a producer. I've been doing about for about four or five years and actually just had my first film released uh, this past December. So I'm hoping I'll be able to speak to some of uh, your concerns if you're doing it for the first time as well. I came up through sort of the production side um, so I'm pretty experienced in physical production and uh, now branching out into doing more um, development and financing and distribution. I, th I think one of the hallmarks of being an independent producer these days is that you have to have a pretty good concept of the A to Z of it all. Um, so even though, you know, maybe you start out in development or you have a focus on getting your film distributed. If you're working on a small budget film, you have to know how to start it in the beginning and take it all the way through the long tail of delivery. And um, this series, we're trying to address that by breaking it up into three parts, as you know. This um, middle part is um, the most costly of <laughs> the whole venture, and that's um, production. So you've already written your script, you've rewritten it 1,500 times, um, you have cast, or so you think, um, <laughs> you have money, or you're told you have money in the bank, um, or it's coming very soon. So um, the trucks are showing up, you have your crew hired, and you're gonna start. Um, I always like to ask, what what do you do the night before production on, on a new feature? Well, hopefully not rewrite the script, <laughs> which is the situation I've been in. I, I try to get sleep, actually. I think that's really important to be well rested. And, uh, you know, if, if you've prepared properly, then uh, hopefully you uh, are able to sleep the night before you start. And that's a, that's a probably a good sign to, to start with. I tend to not sleep and kind of try to review every single detail that I feel like I've forgotten because there are there always are things that fall through the cracks and I think it is good advice to to actually try and rest because you, you will have to encounter a lot of things on the fly and it's important to be well rested and able to deal with them um, as they come up. Thank you. <laughs> I'm always I don't know I have to make sure my phone is fully charged. <laughs> <I think. laughs> um, which can be difficult sometimes. Um, I also, you know, what's your mindset going into the first day? So what are the main, what are the main checklists in your mind? 
and um, who are the key players that you're watching out for that, that first day? Because you want to establish the tone of the shoot. You know, for me, I, I think that um, the key players for the producer are um, any production support staff that you have, any department heads that you're dealing with, so your cinematographer, your production designer, uh, costume designer, hair makeup folks. You, you want to make sure that everybody knows what they're supposed to do, what time they're supposed to be there. Um, and then, of course, the director, the whole, the whole um, basis of the of the project is is based on a relationship with a director and um, from my point of view the producers work is to collaborate with that person and to support the vision of that person and um, be on the same page as them as to what the goals of each day of the production are going to be so um, I focus on those people and allow those people to deal with the people within their department and um, of course, the cast is also, you know, some, something you're always thinking about, and and being mindful of their their call times and um, uh, making sure that they show up when they're supposed to, and that the director is is working with them in a way that's respectful and and uh, effective. I would say um, usually the most prominent thing on my mind is to uh, make sure the director is happy and has everything he needs. It's usually a he for some reason. Um, and um, also to make sure the line producer isn't having panic attacks. <laughs> so those two things keep me quite occupied. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that um, because there is so much chaos going on in production sometimes and there's a lot, there are a lot of details to handle, um, on the first day of production, I, I like to make sure that the director has whatever they need um, in order to communicate the vision that they want for the film and um, try and, as much as possible to keep them isolated from a lot of the kind of logistical details um, of the physical production. I think working in low budget a lot, um, there are a lot of things that the producers have to handle themselves. And I think that also on the first day, something that I found is important is to communicate sort of the the tone to the crew that they're going to be um, well taken care of and that you know there's, there's going to be c good communication between production and the crew. So um, that I think goes from anything from making sure that the food is there and good and uh, that you know directions to set are clear, there's parking instructions that are clear. And I think that when a crew comes and finds those things, those details are well taken care of, it really does set the tone that you know that of, of how the production is going to go. And clean bathrooms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the things I always try to do on the, on the first day is really to go be one of the first people there and to go around and say hello. I mean, I know I usually meet a lot of people in prep, but on set the first day, you're definitely going to get a new wave of people in. And I just like to go through and make sure I really know their names and that they feel like they can come up to me at any point. And just, you know, we're all in this together with a low budget film and I think you have to create a kind of family atmosphere. So I, I really, I know it might sound touchy feely, <laughs> but I, I feel like it goes a long way. If, if, you know, people aren't being paid very much, they're doing it because they love the project, they love the people they're working with. Um, so I, it's a little thing, but I, I try to do that. I go out to the trucks and check on all the folks and, you know, just make them, you know, aware that they're appreciated. I like to um, have done my homework on the actors if I have the chance, so then I can actually have a personal conversation with them and say I like to your work in this or that. And then, you know, they, you're going to be spending many, many hours together over the next several weeks or months, so... Um, it's nice to have a rep an easy rapport with them, so um, that's something that I try to make an effort to do. So a, a question, so once you get past the first day <laughs> and you, you feel like you've created the tone for the set, um, inevitably I think we were discussing in, in the back about how issues come up that you've planned and planned and planned and no matter what you've done, it, 
inevitably, that's part of the job description is you have to deal with making decisions on the fly and solving problems because you're basically on a giant locomotive that is burning money. So um, I would like to, um, to hear some examples, maybe some specific examples of, of, of times when you felt like you've been caught off guard and what you, how you handled it and what you wish you'd known and any um, gems gleaned in retrospect. I think it's good to um, to try to. I mean, a lot a lot of the stuff that 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 sets you up for production is obviously what you do in prep. So, you know, sometimes it's about you know planning ahead for for problems. So, it, you know, in terms of things that can go wrong, you know, as much as possible, you want to have contracts with every vendor or location that you're dealing with, so that there's a clear understanding of what the situation is going to be on the day so that you're trying to avoid problems before they happen but it's true like Kelly said stuff happens and you roll with the punches um, I think it can you know I, I you I've had a situation where the first day of filming it's it's raining and we're supposed to be shooting outside so you know what do you do you you know if you can you have scheduled for a cover set so that you have interiors that you could be doing until the rain clears up and you flip your schedule and you're you know prepared to do things like that um, but there's an example which entails working with your locations department and production staff in order to make that change quickly um, I can give an example of a, a shoot that took place over um, Mardi Gras and so uh, some of the actors thought it would be a great idea to take the crew out um, the night before and party all night. And so everybody, cast and crew, was extremely tired um, during that day of shooting. And so we did have to kind of rearrange um, our expectations for the day um, and the number of pages that we were going to get through because it just wasn't happening. <laughs> and, and who were the key players in, in having to deal with that? Your AD or AD and uh, UPM line producer. <coughs> yeah, I find that I think that for the producer, a primary job of addressing all of these concerns is just kind of knowing um, or being able to make the decision of what really is the priority um, for for, the, for for making the film or for making the day. So um, uh, most of it is hopefully considered in pre-production and you have some idea. Um, it's very, it's, you know, it might be staying in the office, but it, it's important to reserve some finances for um, things that might come up because very often there are problems that will go away if you just throw money at it. And, um, <laughs> and so, you know, you have to be prepared to, to do that. I'll, I'll also say that, um, you know, what happens when something goes wrong is, you know, people people panic or they, they, you know, and unless there's someone clearly leading the way and saying this is what the plan is, you know, and, and, and that might take a moment to just get your, your key players together and say, okay, wh what are we going to do? Come up, with a, come up with an alternate plan and, and then make sure that that information is, is shared with everybody so that people have a sense of confidence. The, the, you know, one thing that, that we stress on every shoot that we do, like the most important thing, and this should go without saying always, is, is safety. And when people are rushing or when things are, are happening um, in a way that was not planned for, mistakes happen and accidents happen and, and it's just not worth it. Like it's never worth it. So um, that should always kind of be at the front of the mind because as a producer, like the buck stops with you. That's if, if you see something that's not safe, you have to step in and you have to be the one who's not afraid to speak up and say, I don't care if it takes us 20 minutes to, 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 to reset, we're gonna stop and we're gonna get this, make this a safe situation. So. And in the worst case scenario, if God forbid something does happen, then it's often the right thing to do to just wrap early, everyone get home, rest, relax, and come back fresh the next day. Yeah, um, I uh, and 
a lot of the, most of the productions I've been on, if, if it's union, we definitely have a medic. Um, if it's lower budget or if it's a short, always, always have a first aid kit. And really seriously talk to your AD. I'm, even if it's a short with 10 people in your backyard, <laughs> just talk with your AD about safety, especially when you're dealing with electricity and ladders and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, have, have a safety do. meeting. It, you know, it, you're, move, you're moving to a new location. There's something unsafe about the location. Pull people together while they're having breakfast and, and just say, here's, here's you, we want to have a quick safety meeting. This is important information for you to have. People are, are responsive to that and they appreciate the information. And you guys know as, as SAG members, um, one of the stipulations of becoming SAG signatory for a, a production is that you have to show proof of workers' comp insurance. So, um, you know, you have to figure that out well ahead of time in prep because you have to supply the proof of insurance to SAG and everyone else. <laughs> so it's, you know, you just have to have that in the forethought of your, your mind. Um, I, going back to locations, I was, you talked, Jen, about having to deal with weather contingencies. Have any of you ever lost a location? not based on weather. We um, were shooting a horror movie and needed a church for a very gruesome scene. And um, they said, yes, yes, that it would be fine. And then did they see the finally pages? asked for the pages. <laughs> and we were just a few days out from shooting there. And of course, they said, absolutely not. <laughs> so we had to have a backup. Um, and I think that's the lesson there throughout production. You've got to have backups for everything. So back up in that you had scouted it and you had it in your mind, mm -hmm. had you negotiated a deal mm -hmm. or? Okay. Everything was ready to go. So we could just switch the locations and get moving. Because you knew, especially with that, it was sensitive material. Exactly. I mean, I was in a situation recently uh, doing a project with Film Independent actually, where we nearly lost the location because we had elected to shoot without a permit, and um, it was actually a call that I had made. We just sort of rolled the dice, and we were we we got caught, and so um, and uh, you know we did we did have the permission of the property owner, but we didn't have permission of the city, and so um, when the police came and told us to shut down at lunch, um, it was there was a lot of scrambling to try and um, uh, kind of appease the local. Um, government and uh, but they could have very well made us not shoot and we would have been in, in big trouble um, and that was a, just a situation where we didn't have a backup and we just got lucky so what were the magic words <laughs> well I mean I think that it's it, dealing with a lot of you know be it SAG or or gift of governments it really, the what you can get frequently <laughs> depends on what your rapport is with the representative that you're working with. And so, um, you know, they can, they basically, this, this woman, I, I told them we were doing something that was not for profit, that we had the permission, and we were just very kind to, I was, you know, I didn't react in a way that was angry or anything like that because she was fully in the right. Um, and, uh, and she basically was just kind to us and, and let us do it and said, don't do it again. That's nice. <laughs> we got lucky. Yeah, we, we, I've had that happen where, you know, we're in a, we're, sh we're in, in the middle of shooting a scene and, you know, we, we had the fire department show up on the set and they said, you know, you're in a fire brush area and you need to have a certain type of permit for this particular area of the county and you don't have that permit, so we're shutting you down. And you're, I mean, the best thing you can do is comply with the law and, shut down and reschedule and get the permit you know but but obviously that that comes down to you know pre-production I haven't done that mis I haven't made that mistake again <laughs> since that happened um, but uh, you know those those things do happen I we've also been in situations where and this doesn't happen anymore either but on one of my first films where we were working with a location manager and we you know everybody shows up to the location I am not stressed at all everything looks great and then the location owner comes out and said, says, 
you know, we never, we never closed this deal and you guys aren't supposed to be here and, you know, you're negotiating on the spot with somebody because the, the location manager didn't actually finish signing the deal. So, you know, we check all, now, now me and my partner always wanna eyeball every contract, every location agreement, make sure that we know exactly you know, what the terms are, what time we're supposed to be in, what time we're supposed to be out. Um, you know, are, are we expected to pay if we go over in hours? What are, what, how, how does it work? So we now avoid those. The, the, the whole trick of producing is trying to avoid the problems and then when they come up, just trying to be reasonable and level-headed and, um, you know, fearless a little bit. And remembering that lesson for the next movie. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And respectful, I think as Matthew said, that, that does go a long way. And um, I, it, since you guys mentioned permits, and I know we covered that a little bit in pre-production, but what I've found, especially on the lower budget stuff, is with um, in production, if you're going for four weeks, say, the locations of your third and fourth week are not entirely locked necessarily, and you're still doing all your permits and all that kind of stuff, and things can change very fluidly. Um, do you have any uh, suggestions about dealing with that? I know you, you mentioned a location manager. Sometimes I've been on shoots, especially shorts, where we didn't have a, mm -hmm. a location manager per se. It all ended up under my hat. Mm -hmm. um, so any advice? on that kind of stuff? I mean, it's, it's part of the work, you know, you, you prepare as much as you can and then there's always like that one, you know, grocery store that you didn't, you, you know, you only need to be there for four hours and we just haven't found that yet. So, you know, then you're like looking for time throughout your schedule where you can go and scout it. Obviously it's better to, to do all of that stuff in advance, but it doesn't always happen. And, and so you just have to be able to try and stay ahead of it as much as you can. The worst case scenario is that you wrap production and then you have to go and do a, a kind of like a second unit after the fact type of, of you know, reshoot. And, and it's not ideal because it costs more money. So we actually avoid that always. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you also mentioned it earlier in your careers having chosen not to have a permit. Um, can, can you tell us the pros and cons? I get that question a lot at Film Independent, at, you know, asking for advice, because it, those of you who are familiar with Film LA is the, um, is the uh, business that takes on permitting for the entire industry for the city of LA. And their website is very helpful. They'll give you all the rules. And you really need to be permitted if, if I want to film in my backyard, I'm officially supposed to have a permit. Mm -hmm. And I have people coming to me making low budget films and say, it's really expensive. What can I do? And I think the expression was roll the dice. Um, can, you, can you give us some pros and cons about that? Well, I think that, as Jennifer alluded to, the, the when you're in production, the ideal situation is that you have as much control over um, all the different elements as possible. Um, and so when you, the, and, but there are many corners that you can cut and the more that you do, the more risk you have that something is gonna go wrong and then you're gonna end up spending more money later. And I think that when you're in production, that's always the, the, the balancing act is, I have this much money, you know, do I want to spend it dotting every I and crossing every T or am I willing to take a little bit of risk um, knowing that if it should fall through in the future, I may have to come back and spend more money to, to do that. Um, so um, in terms of you know, doing a small production in Los Angeles, um, it is generally difficult to get away with a lot of stuff because it's a very film savvy town. Um, I think that if it, things that are generally, that would look like a, a sort of a news gathering crew, what they call an EPK, um, tends to be able to get away with more, so like a small crew of maybe four or five people. Um, but anything beyond that is very difficult in Los Angeles. I, I found, again, on short films where I have rolled the dice, <laughs> um, I've found that if I am shooting at a, even a private location and I decide not to permit, 
I am very conscientious with the crew about making sure there's no equipment in the street, no equipment on the sidewalks, nothing glaringly there. And as you talk about the footprint, you know, I want people that have walkies on or, you know, water bottles. Just it's, it's about going through and talking to the crew and saying, please do this. This is very important. There's some really great craft service in the back room. Um, <laughs> um, so I, again, it's it's, and I know many of you are working on short films, so it's just, it's something to keep in mind. But if also you should look at the Film LA site because if you're doing anything affiliated with nonprofits or with student film work, often you can get um, deeply discounted rates or waivers. So. Yeah, the thing about permits is that they're not that expensive. Like they re it really is fairly affordable to do the permitting, you have to do it in advance. There's, I think you have to do it seven to 10 days in advance. I don't remember exactly what the cutoff is, but um, you know, you wanna get your paperwork in, you wanna be really nice to the rep, and it's not that hard to do it, and it's worth it for peace of mind to just know we're permitted to be here, we're allowed to be here, I'm allowed to put up a sign that says, please don't park here because my truck is gonna park here that's that's really helpful. The situations that you get in where you think we should, you know, are we really gonna permit this is like, you know, when it starts to get expensive is when you're required to have fire safety officers, when you're required to have police officers. Um, so anything that you're doing in a street or, you know, any kind of driving stuff is generally, uh, you know, if you go through the city, they really want you to have, you know, depending on the scope of the, of the, of the, um, the the shot uh, or the or the scene you know they they may at, you know want you to close down the street to do it in which case that's very expensive to do so um, you know sometimes the things that we might gamble on are if the camera is going to be inside of a car um, and there's any anyone else is also going to be inside the car then you know that might be something that we we would consider doing unpermitted. Um, you know, I've done s short film shoots where we're literally doing 20 locations in a day. It's a it's a skeleton sized crew of like three or four people, and we're going to be in a particular location for 15 minutes, grabbing one shot. I'm probably not going to permit that. If we get caught, we're going to find another you know uh, street sign to to shoot in front of. You know, there there there's 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 reasons why you would maybe just you know kind of. Roll the dice. Um, so we, t we talked a bit about locations. I'd like to talk t about one of the major components we mentioned in the beginning about the actors. Um, have any of you ever had, uh, have lost a, lost a cast member because of a contract dispute or scheduling or whatever reason and h how have you dealt with that? Oftentimes, um, an actor's representative will um, not be completely honest about that actor's availability because they're trying to leverage one film against the other and get the actor the bigger paycheck. Um, and so that's heartbreaking because you see the director fall in love with an actor and then at the very last minute, you lose them and they have to reimagine the role with someone else. And so it's about you know having those short lists ahead of time and knowing who your second and third choices are gonna be. Um, and as actors, if you can always be <laughs> completely honest about your availability, that makes our lives much easier. Um, and um, yeah, that's about it. Um, I haven't been in a situation where I've I've lost an actor because usually that's that's really something that you figure out ahead of time. You know, you have a contract. Everybody knows where they're supposed to be. Your AD has called a number of times that week. They've been to wardrobe fittings. They've been to they've met with your hair and makeup department. So usually it's not like you know I, I've never had a situation where someone just you know falls out like during production in the middle of a show. But I have had situations where an actor doesn't show up when they're supposed to show up, and everybody's standing around waiting for the actor, and then you're dealing with that same kind of, how do we adjust the schedule to 
to uh, what, what can we be shooting until this person shows up? And you have three people calling, blowing up the agents and the managers, and you know, calling the person on their uh, you know home phone, and you know that happens. Not just actors. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was just going to mention a situation where um, an actor who will remain nameless was not behaving in the most respectful way on set and was being late every day and was not showing up sober and was being argumentative and so that that was a difficult situation because you, it was obvious after several days had passed that it would be easier to just let him go and deal with the consequences of that than have to um, work around his limitations. And how did you how did you address that through his representation or um, directly? Directly combination. A combination directly several times, and when that wasn't effective um, through representation, and then um, obviously working with the writer to reduce that role in the mm -hmm. script and figure out a way to. Um, tell the story effectively without um, making it clear that we've lost that character. I, um, I, one of the features I did, we lost our lead male um, probably three days before the beginning. Um, and he had already gone through wardrobe. Um, there were 40 something days of story, story days of wardrobe. And you know we had just done a lot. The contract was almost, almost, almost signed, and then he decided he didn't want to do it. So that um, really sent us into a tailspin because, like I said about the locomotive, it had, you know, it had started rolling. <laughs> so um, we really felt like we couldn't push. We were up against the holidays and all that kind of stuff. Um, but our casting director was great. And you know, we called her immediately and said, you know, remind us again, you know, we saw all these great people like, and she said, okay, I'll check their avails. And she was back to us in 30 minutes with, uh, you know, our top three people. And we, you know, we recovered and I think, you know, it was actually a blessing. So it's, but we did go way over in wardrobe because the, the guys were totally different sizes. Um, <laughs> Which is, again, that's where the contingency comes. I mean, there was no way I could say, no, you cannot spend more money. We have to put clothes on this actor. So um, <laughs> part of the character. Um, but, you know, it was, uh, it was harrowing. <laughs> but uh, that was an instance where the, the new actor's representation was really amazing. And we said, look, this is the um, favored nations deal we have among our leads. And this is what we can offer. We do not have time to go round and round in negotiations. You know, it's a take it or leave it because we've got two or three other people we can go to. And that worked, so. Uh, Lucy, you um, also talked about, uh, what's your relationship with actors reps in the during shoots, if you you know you said you like to uh, have a, a a personal relationship with the actors and make them feel at home, what, how do you feel as a producer? You need to reach out to their reps. Is that part of the process? Or um, usually, I don't have to do the reaching out. Uh, they will reach out to me <laughs> on a on a constant basis, and I just have to either take those calls or return those calls or emails, and provide as much information as they're asking for. And it's just about communication. Um, usually a, an agent will want to make sure that their actor's happy so that they're not going to have to expect, um, you know, angry phone calls in the middle of the night. Um, so, you know, I can provide anecdotes about the day shooting or, <laughs> you know, just say what a pleasure that actor has been to work with. Um, and that usually does the trick. A another actor story, I had, uh, we had a lovely, lovely um, actress and she wanted to do the, the role and was completely game, all aspects, and we had such difficulty with her reps. And I realized later that, that she had absolutely no idea 
how difficult things were. And I felt like they did such a disservice to her because it, you know, it made us way up on the other, you know, the other side of things with production. You know, they wanted to halt, they wanted to change the definition of net profits for the entire cast and crew when everyone else had already signed off on it. So that, um, again, was a, and, and it had nothing to do with her. She was absolutely lovely, but it, it made me uh, realize that I think a lot of actors we deal with are not necessarily aware of how their reps conduct themselves. Maybe not in, you know, you may not realize how much they actually do in a great way, but also some things that can undermine. Yeah, I've been in that situation and um, mid-shoot have had to uh, help an actor get new representation and mm -hmm. give, uh, you know, recommendations of my favorite agents and managers. So it happens. Yeah, it, it does happen. I mean, I, I think, you know, reps, they, they <coughs> perform a function, but they're busy and they have multiple clients that they're representing. So, you know, the one actor that you're working with doesn't get all of their attention usually, unless it's like a huge star. In which case, you know, you're gonna have that agent come to set, and you're gonna be really nice to that agent, and you're gonna be talking to them on a really regular basis. But, but generally speaking, you know, I try to keep the the agents and and the managers, especially the managers, because they're they tend to be more the day to day people. Um, CC'd when I on on they know what the call times are for the actor. They know what the expectation is you know, where we're gonna be. We, we just try to keep them informed and we, we do invite everybody, you know, all the, all the reps um, of our lead cast to, to, to visit set if they'd like. And, you know, we try to have them come at, you know, at lunchtime because it's easier, you know, that we'll have them come like maybe 20 or 30 minutes before lunch. They can watch the scene and then they can chill out with their client and rap for a while with the, with the director. and. That, that tends to you know make everybody feel comfortable. It's all, all, also always nice to be able to shake someone's hand and sort of you know put put the the name to the to a face and that kind of thing. Yeah, I find that very helpful with um, not just the actor reps but also the guild reps mm -hmm. and um, union reps. Um, sometimes the oh, well definitely the financiers, but also people. You know, if, if we're dealing with the bond company or um, bankrupts, it's just all these people involved in the process, and they really like to see what goes on in the making of the sausage. So it's it's a nice gesture, I think, to just to always have people. your caterer make a couple extra lunches. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good thing. Exactly. It's all about the food. <laughs> so so we've been talking about actors, um, and I know a lot of you in the audience are actors, producers, writers, directors. So um, to our panelists, in your, in your experience, what has it been like to work with a multi-hyphenate, uh, an artist wearing many hats? I, I've, had, I've had pretty positive experiences. You know, it all also comes down to prep, making sure that they're, uh, you know, um, that there's a plan in place so that when you're on set, everybody uh, knows how it's gonna run. And so, you know, sometimes if it's an actor that's directing, you know, they, you know, they, they'll, they'll want the producers watching the takes a lot more carefully because there's, they wanna know that their performance is good or they'll have, you know, an acting coach or they'll have somebody that they wanna have um, nearby who can sort of just be looking out for performance because their brain is in a million different places. So that, that's one thing that comes up. Um, but, but generally the experiences have been really good. Um, you know, it makes sense to me why an actor would wanna write some material for themselves and be proactive about how they are gonna kickstart their own career if they're not getting the roles that they wanna get or if they see themselves in a way that other people aren't seeing them. And, and I think that um, it's that, that ability to be proactive and uh, be open to, to learning how to do something beyond just you know, what you maybe expected you were gonna be doing um, that, that really can launch a career. So 
Um, I, I'm all for it, but it's, it's a lot of work, and I think a lot of people get into it and don't realize quite how involved and intense it is. I think generally the more hats someone's worn, the more considerate and prepared they are during production. Um, and if they are perhaps, um, if, if the film is their directorial debut, if they've had plenty of experience as an actor or as a producer, then they will at least, they'll get it much more quickly. So the more hats, the better, I say. I've worked with a lot of, um, especially producer directors, and I think that I found it's um, often a, a very beneficial to define up front sort of like what the responsibilities are. Um, in particular, I think if the director, uh, the director or producer has brought a lot of the financing because I think that if that's the case, often they um, want to have more say over a lot of things, which they may be entitled to, but it can get confusing um, when, when you're in production or, or at any stage of the process when it's not defined who's, what, what, what decisions are gonna made, be made together and what decisions are gonna be made separately. Um, and I think it's good to define those up front. Yeah, and I'll say, I feel like a lot of people don't really understand what it is to produce, and then once you do it, it's kind of like, oh, okay, now I see what producers do. And so, you know, one thing, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard about this whole question about what the producer credit is, what, what it should mean and what it's worth and who should get it. Um, you know, once you've produced, really produce, where, it, you know, everything falls on your shoulders and ultimately you're responsible to the financier and you're the one who found the project and or wrote the project. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes it really, uh, it makes sense to, um, to, like Matthew's saying, define what those credits really are. You know, I don't, I don't, have any expectation that I'm going to take the actor's credit and be like, hey, I'm going to share this credit with you because, you know, I had a lot to do with crafting your character. Um, <laughs> you know, you just don't do that. So it's kind of like sometimes when, um, you know, people want to have a producer credit, you know, it's a touchy subject. So it's something that I think makes sense to be respectful of and really, um, uh, you know, give thought to who should get those credits. I think you'll have enough to do in your role as an actor. You don't need to take on any more work. <laughs> Let the producers do their producing. Um, so if, as we've talked about actor, actor directors in, in particular. Um, so I think, how many actor directors do we have out here? A few. Um, what's a checklist? You know, like a nuts and bolts kind of thing. What do they need to be aware of? The thing that comes to my mind is you're supposed to be directing a scene, but you also should be in hair and makeup. You know, how, do, how, does, how does that affect the schedule of the day? And what are the concerns that really need to be addressed up front? I don't think I've been in that situation. I, mean, I, I, I have, and I, you, have to, you, you have to work around that. So if that means that the, you know, the director is, is talking to their actors while they're in the makeup chair, then that's what's happening. And, or, or they, they are you know, getting into makeup before the day starts and they're ready to go. You know, the schedule is also you know, a, a reflection of that part of the process. And um, I, you make it work. It's all in the planning. Everything is in the planning. It really is. And, and when you've worked with actor directors before, um, what are the different approaches you've seen to, um, do they want to watch the footage immediately after takes? Or how do you deal with that? Because that can really slow down the day too. Yeah, the first day, <laughs> all the actors want, the director wants to see themselves. And then when they realize how time consuming that is, um, if they feel good about the work that's happening, they usually let that go. And <laughs> I think they start to become intuitive about when they got it. They know because they felt it and they know that it worked. And then it's about turning to the, the DP and saying, how was that for you? Is everybody good? Okay, we can move on because I got what I needed from a performance standpoint. I think that's true even if they're not you know, wearing the hat of the director and the actor. Mm -hmm. Just, um, you know, in, 
and being in that kind of video village position and um, sitting with the director and as the actors come around after they're taken want to see their scene, um, just giving them a confidence boost helps and letting them know they did a great job and you know they don't need to do it again really <laughs> and, and there's always that situation where it's like you know what we should we should go we should watch this and and that happens and that's totally reasonable and fine and and it's an, an amazing tool to have playback on set so you know when you need it you use it i think related to that too if you can afford it to have your editor on set um, it can be often very helpful, particularly if it's someone that the director trusts pretty implicitly, so they can watch the takes and, you know, um, without directing, you know, give suggestions like, oh, it would be helpful if we had this angle, or we might want to do that again and do it faster. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just on that note, because I think it's really smart to be thinking about post when you're in production, because it's just a few weeks away. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't always have our editors on set. We try to have them nearby, but we, ha we do have an editor when we're filming. And our editor is getting the footage um, every, every night after we finish filming. Part of, the, part of the day is making sure that the footage goes from the camera department to the post department. Um, so, you know, if you're shooting on a digital format, it's gonna go to a data wrangler. At each, each card or whatever the format is, is gonna go to the data wrangler. And then from there, it's gonna go to a runner or a post assistant or a, an editorial assistant. And that person is gonna make sure that it's all um, uh, conformed for the editor to start working. They, they may be the person to ingest it. You, you know, part of what we do in pre-production is make sure that there's a workflow that's established. And that, that workflow is all the way from camera to uh, editorial. And so in the production phase, we are cutting the film. And it's for that same reason. Even if the editor's not on set watching, <coughs> which sometimes I think is better that they aren't because they're, they're unbiased. They're not thinking about all the things that are happening on set. They're just looking at the footage and they're, they're saying, you know what, you, you really need a close-up of that set of keys because if you don't have that, you know, it's just really not that clear that he's gonna take off or, you know, whatever. You need, you need someone to be able to to look at it um, and, and start cutting and tell you what you need, tell you what you're missing. Um, you're getting too many close-ups, you need to widen out, whatever it is. So that, that set of eyes is really important. Sort of along those lines, one lesson that I learned um, is also not only thinking about post-production, but also your, your distribution um, while you're in production. Um, one thing in particular that I think gets overlooked a lot um, is the importance of doing still photography and um, c collecting um, deliverables and uh, marketing contact that content, sorry, that your distributor will want um, to go along with, you know, behind the scenes type of interviews and footage because to collect all of that stuff later is much more expensive. So if you can, you know, if you can collect that all while you're in production, it'll serve you but well. I, I second that yeah, big time. Every, every single movie I've done, this conversation comes up. We, you know, the budget's really tight. You know, can we cut the still photographer? We don't, we, you know, we're not, we're not gonna have, we don't need stills, we don't need EPK, we don't need that stuff. And it's a huge mistake. Do, if you expect your film to have any kind of release whatsoever, or any kind of life after you've finished cutting it, do not cut that piece. You need it. And, and, it's okay to have a friend come and take pictures, but it does not replace a stills photographer. And people talk about being able to pull stills from the footage, which you can do. It also doesn't replace a stills photographer. Mm -hmm. We found actually um, in a lot of the films that I've worked on that, um, actually all of them, um, that it's extremely helpful to do a photo shoot with the, with the lead actors on set as well while everyone's in the same place. And so you can use them in the um, marketing um, so that when you're later creating your artwork for your poster, um, you have all of that already taken care of. Yeah, I, we did that on the last feature I was involved with and we had a stills photographer come for about 50% of the shoot because um, we chose our locations very carefully and which days, which actors, and wanted to make sure we got all of our major people. 
and then we did have um, one day with a white backdrop and in costume and that's those things are turning those assets are great for marketing we're really excited about what we'll do with that yeah uh, one thing to keep in mind it, it, it is it is a marketing and kind of like a down the road kind of thing but but the reason it's so important there's a couple reasons that that it really becomes important one and you may know this already as SAG members but um, the the cast is actually um, allowed to see the photos of themselves and make kills of the photos. So a certain percentage of the photography that you have, you're going to lose. So take a lot of pictures yeah. and um, make sure that you you can you can you know afford those kills essentially. So so there there's that piece of it. And then also a distributor will require that you deliver a certain number of stills. To, to them, so that's, that's a co contractual obligation that you're gonna have to close your deal with a distributor, and um, that's, it, they need it for marketing, so it's important. Great, I'm, I'm really glad you guys brought up the editorial because I, I find it's, it's so key, it is so, so key, and you need to have it in place in prep and have everything ironed out so that they're there and ready to take off with the rest of the team in production. Um, we actually have quite a few questions, so I think I'll move on to questions and then we'll, we can, if that brings up more topics, we can keep bouncing. Fire away. All righty. Um, my eyesight keeps changing, wonder why. Um, <laughs> When you are working on a very tight budget, what is the smallest crew you can work with, in your opinion? For example, say the budget is 60,000. What are the absolutely necessary crew members? It's a trick question. <laughs> because it's a story, right? Well, it, it, I think there's, yeah, there's, a, there's so many variables. And by the way, on a $60,000 budget, that could be a two-day shoot, in which case you can have plenty of people. But if it's a four-week shoot for $60,000, um, maybe you're talking about, the, if that's what you're talking about, then it's, it's probably a lot less people. Um, who do you absolutely have to have? You have to have a DP, someone who's going to shoot. Maybe that's the same person as the director. That sounds horrible. Um, um, Maybe you need an actor, maybe you don't. <laughs> it could be an experimental film. <laughs> sound? Um, maybe you need sound, maybe, <laughs> maybe you don't. You, don't. Okay. <laughs> it, it, you know, it depends on what the movie is. Yeah, I think it does depend on what the movie is, but um, I, so there's no one answer for that, but probably the answer is that you sh if you know that that is going to be your maximum budget, you should d design your story around it, about uh, around the what you can get um, for that money. Yeah, I, I I can't tell you how many people have sent me scripts and said, you, you know, we want to make this for a hundred thousand dollars, and and you know, it's got you know, 20 characters, and it's got, you know, a car chase, and it's got an animal, and it's got a kid, and it's like, you know, I don't think that it's, you have to think about the scope of the project. It's, it's totally, a, a, it has to be, a, you know, the budget has to be appropriate to the, to the script. Which usually means one location, right? <laughs> if you're talking about $60,000, keep it all in one place. Or in interiors that are easily accessible, meaning free. <laughs> like your house. <laughs> um, so, a, a next question: Do you always use a casting director? No. So, some, I mean, we we love to use casting directors, but the smaller the budget, you know, we've done we've done movies where, you know, the director knows all the actors that they want to have in the movie, so what's, we don't need a casting director. And the casting director is basically opening up their contact list to you. So if you know actors already, then you don't need the casting director. If you know everyone um, that you're going to need to fill all the roles in your movie, then you're good. But if you don't, then the casting director can come in and say, 
I know the perfect person for this role. You need to see, you need to meet this new actor. Um, they're there to share their relationships with you, and that's what you're paying for. I will say that a good tip for um, low budget things, though, is to, if you would like to work with a casting director, which is, which is wonderful, um, is you can often find an associate, um, a casting associate who has, who has not had a casting director credit on a feature yet. And so, if, especially if they work with an established casting director, they really have the power of the casting director's office because they interact with the same people, they have the same relationships, and they can be, um, they can often do it for free because they want the credit, or they can do it for a greatly reduced cost. Yeah, that's that's true across the board for a lot of the key positions. You know, on on low budget films, one of the things that we're, you know, and we, my partner and I really pride ourselves on this. But w one of the things that we're doing is we're we're training people. People are are getting their start. They're getting an opportunity to go from being, you know, a, an assistant in a department to being a department head, and that's that's. That's awesome. I mean, you're, you know, um, the people who have, have been working their way up the ladder bring a lot of experience and knowledge to the table, but they need those opportunities. And so, um, you know, the, every department really you could look at that way. And I, I've also worked with casting directors in a kind of tiered effect, I would call it. I would say, well, I'm going to attach the leads because I know that's just going to take a lot of grunt work. And if I can go out and try to get the major characters, then could I ask you, once we get that momentum going, can you fill out the rest of the cast at a reduced fee? And they still get the c credit for the whole film, and so it has mm -hmm. worked out budget-wise for me before. Or oftentimes you can have a, an LA casting director and then your local casting. So that would mean hiring your leads in LA or New York, flying them to the location, and then your local casting director, in the meantime, has been meeting with all of the um, the local act acting community and um, identifying the people that he needs to introduce to the director and, and audition and put on tape. Um, I think I'm going to consolidate several questions here, actually. Um, talking about, because I know we've talked about production, uh, higher budget productions, lower budget productions, features, shorts. Mm -hmm. And um, folks are, there's a general thread here of wanting to know what do we mean when we talk about low budget? Mm -hmm. And you know, is that a million or is that 100,000 or is that 10,000? And that's kind of an open-ended question, but what are your thoughts on that? It just depends who you're talking to, I think. <laughs> um, I've heard studio execs say that um, you know a twenty million dollar movie was low budget. I mean, it's like it. It really depends who you're talking to. Um, the most of the films I've been involved with um, are in the one to five million dollar budget range, and that is considered low budget. Though when you're making a truly independent film with whatever money you have in your bank account, that probably seems like a lot of money. <laughs> The feature that I, I did that was released this year was uh, we completed for 85000 So it was, uh, I would consider, quite low budget. Bravo. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, and a lot of the, the project was conceived, um, as we've been talking about, to accommodate sort of the, the level of budget that we knew that we could raise. So um, the writer-directors wrote something that took place all day exterior. And uh, so we'd be, we had very little um, lighting equipment that we could use. We filmed in the Angeles National Forest, which happens to be a very cheap location. And so uh, we, we had a few things that did cost a little bit more, but we really needed to pack it all into that budget. And um, you know, there are, there are a lot of challenges to working in such a low budget. Um, but I think that at the same time, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of creativity that becomes sparked when you have constraints too. So. I mean, I think uh, you know, in the in the feature, I think most shorts are probably uh, on a relatively low budget. But you know, it's in the, in the feature world, I'd say, you know, it it varies, and it does depend who you're talking to. You know, people use the term micro budget when they're talking about projects that are made for like you know a hundred thousand dollars or less, or a couple hundred thousand dollars or less. Th that's a that's a pretty small budget for for a feature film. 
A good you guideline actually might be the just the SAG, you know, yeah. levels. Yeah, I was going to say, I, in my mind, it usually breaks down in, in terms of the guilds and unions mm -hmm. specifications of what contracts. Um, so there's the SAG modified low budget, mm -hmm. the ultra low budget. And then there's um, the rules and regulations of the Independent Spirit Awards, which I think, you know, oftentimes, um, when the nominations are announced, there's sometimes a really big movie in there that stands out as having you a much wonder, bigger budget. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think the cap on that is 20 million. Um, so yeah, so in the Spirit Awards have nominated micro budget features all the way up until I think it's around 20 million. Well, because the definition of an independent film, as you may know, is basically any film that's financed outside of the studio system. So that's a pretty big range. And there's some pretty um, big companies and wealthy companies that are financing films that are not studios. So those are actually considered still independent films. Here's another kind of open-ended question for you. Um, can you easily define producer? And if you have no production experience and want to produce, um, what's a way in? Should you work at a production company or partner with someone or any suggestions? There's no one answer to that. There's a million different ways in, but um, one good piece of advice would be to find someone who is doing it right now and um, make yourself indispensable to them. So you're basically um, at their beck and call 24-7. And so when they make their next movie, you'll be right there by their side, soaking up all the information and the experience. Um, and as they get more successful, um, you'll come along for the ride. That's often a great way. Um, what was the other question? What doesn't a producer do? <laughs> I mean, the, it, you know, it's, it's, it's literally, there's so many different people who, are, who are, are called producers, and the roles really do vary. You know, someone could be bringing financing. Someone could represent somebody who's really important to the movie, a writer, a director. Could be a manager, a manager that takes a producing credit. Um, and everybody, you know, all the people who get producing credits generally contribute something. But what I do as a producer is all the rest of the things, which is choosing material, finding money, finding cast that adds value to the package, putting it through production, finding the distributor, working with the distributor, um, being the distributor in some cases. So. Uh, it, it's a pretty expansive title, actually. Another way in to producing would be to, um, outside of kind of the industry network, would be just to find uh, a filmmaker or a project that you're really passionate about, and then live, eat, and breathe that project until you get it made. And, and that is essentially what, what a producer does. They will push the project up the hill until finally it has financing and it is cast and all of the elements are in place and it can get made. But it's a, it can be a really long process. So one thing, you know, a, a couple of the really important lessons that I feel like I, I've learned over the years is, you know, really love the material and love the project because you're in it for the long haul. And also um, make sure you like the people that you're working with because you're in it with them for a really long time. and. It's like you know deciding to have a baby with somebody, and then you know you have this baby with them, and if you hate each other, it's really not a good situation. <laughs> as or in legal terms, you could split the baby. <laughs> um, as someone who's still trying to figure some of this out, I think that um, I would say that you know there there are many different roles that a producer has to play, and I wouldn't be discouraged if physical production is not your strength because that's definitely something that you can hire someone else to do. Um, so I would say that you know a, a good way to get started is to 
figure out what your strengths are. That might be finding great material, having relationship with talent, or being able to find money, or relationships with distributors, and finding people who complement your skills and working with them. Yeah, I, I mean, w you know, I, I, I feel like one uh, w way that I think within the industry that, that really does make sense as a way to um, get the lay of the land, especially if you're interested in producing films for um, mainstream distribution or um, to, to work within, let's call it the Hollywood system, you know, one of the, one thing that I did when I was uh, just starting out was I worked for a, a talent agent. I worked uh, at ICM, and I feel like I learned so much about how the business operates, what deals look like, who all the players in town were, um, what different companies were looking for in terms of material, what different actors were looking for in terms of material, what an agent does how they think, um, how long they're going to spend on the phone with each person, and why. Um, it's it's really it was really an invaluable kind of um, starting place for me. Oh, there's my partner Cora. <laughs> yeah, if you do have the uh, if you are lucky enough to get the opportunity to um, get kind of the inside look at the business and intern or um, work at an agency or management company. It will be like boot camp and that knowledge and experience will stay with you as you go on to produce um, for many years and it will really open your eyes to, you know, the business from a different angle, a different perspective. Yeah, I, I think there are many different ways in. I, I have a background in, in education and also in um, uh, finance. And I was the world's oldest intern when I came out here. <laughs> um, but I, I, was, I hit the jackpot in that the, the opportunity I have was to work on a million dollar film with an amazing producer who once she figured out she could trust me, I think, she was ready to give me a lot of responsibility. And I was so excited because I figured out that producing is so much like, it's like project management and back in the business days of my life. You know, it's, you've got an A to a Z. You know, you've got the idea, you wanna get it out into the world. So there are many, many steps and you can make lists and you can check boxes and all that kind of stuff. And it's not rocket science, but it does have a specific vocabulary. And that's what I had to realize because I was older, I had experience as, as all of, you know, anyone who has a career in acting, like you guys have been on set, you know these things. It's just, it's a matter of understanding what, what the new lingo is and, and how you have to adapt that. <laughs> um. <laughs> my soapbox. Um, so a new question here. How do you handle replanning when you find your time estimates are incorrect? Too short a time to shoot a scene or in rare scenarios you finish shooting earlier? <laughs> yes, that is rare. <laughs> but it does happen occasionally. I can't speak to that last part. But um, uh, I have been in the situation where y you know you run out of time and, and you your days are up. Um, on a million dollar movie, uh, 15 to 18 days is um, kind of a, a standard schedule. Um, and so when you wrap, then you have to start planning your pickups and that will probably be in a different location with a different crew and you'll have to fly your actor to wherever that is and it's very problematic and it has a ton of issues that come along with that. So if you can avoid it, that's the best scenario. I think you really, um, it's all in the planning. You know, the, it, the j whose job it is to handle the schedule and uh, the hour to hour on set is your first AD. And I tend to work really closely with first ADs because um, I like to know where we're supposed to be when and I like to know when we're running behind and um, what I try to do is a timed shot list for the day. So everybody's on the same page 
because we've gone through it in prep. We know what the shots for every scene in the movie are gonna be. We know how long we think those shots are gonna take us. And we create a shot list for the day in the order of the scenes that we're gonna shoot. And we have an estimate of time for how long each uh, scene is gonna take us. And we try to stay on schedule. And when we're moving, be when we're falling behind, we are either looking ahead to see places where we can consolidate or make changes to the shooting schedule or to the, sh to the shot list, or we're, um, we're saying, okay, we're looking at what we're doing right now and saying, do we really need all these shots and um, making changes. And we, we try to plan all of that out before we get to set. Um, but it does happen. And sometimes you have to bump a scene to another day um, and then accommodate you know, a whole other scene on another day. That happens all the time. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a constant time management uh, puzzle. Rubik's Cube. <laughs> and meal penalties are the plague of my life. Um. Yeah, we, we, honestly, like, I, I, I don't like to serve lunch late ever, and I don't like to go over a 12-hour day ever. And I'm a real stickler about it as a producer, and I really hold my, my ADs to, to those schedules because people get burned out. It becomes unsafe for them to work when they're tired. Um, I try to shoot five-day weeks. This, this all has to do with what Matthew was talking about earlier, is creating the right tone on set and making people feel like they're safe and they're looked after. And, um, and respected. <laughs> and respected, exactly. Yeah, I, I tend to go and check in with the AD, you know, on the hour or so and just, just see how we're doing with the shot list and the schedule. And just I want to have a good enough relationship with that AD that they feel like they can come to me and say, I don't know that we're going to be out of this scene before lunch, you know, so, so that I ha so it's not a surprise. I really like to, so I like to be on set. I know some producers are on set or off set. I, I like to be right there and make sure that, that my presence is felt. <laughs> it, it also comes down to, I think, making sure that everybody on set is on the same page. Because, you know, a, a first AD doesn't want to go to the director and say, look, you know, we have to cut shots. A first AD is not going to say that to the director. So that's really um, a conversation that needs to have already happened. And, you know, as the producer, I don't have a problem going up to the director and saying, if we're going to make our day, we have to really take a, a closer look at this. Um, so it, I think it's important as a producer on low budget projects to stay really involved in that way. Yeah, because um, in low budget, I mean, even if you're not IATSE or Teamster, the, the other big guild unions you have to deal with, it, just if you're the ultra low budget SAG and that even those meal penalties can run, you know, there's a financial repercussion. But again, it, it also is not respectful to your actors. And it's, it's you know, not a good thing to, to put into motion, so, as you guys know. Mm -hmm. Speaking of actors, question from an actor. <laughs> uh, question for producer, <laughs> question. What do you do when you're on set and an actor is talking during, talking w while others are filming? And you ask the actor to, um, you know, observe the, the silence. I'm rewording some of this. Um, and they continue to talk to others while filming. So I think the general deal of how, how do you relate with actors when you, you feel like they're not behaving properly? I think um, you will have to designate a producer to um, almost babysit that actor and, and take them out of that environment. And um, in a very informal and you know, careful and friendly way, positive, as positive as possible, convey the situation and um, make them understand that they might, what they're doing might have an effect on <laughs> the shooting and on the film as a whole. Um, and so, but those conversations always need to happen out of earshot of the rest of the cast and crew. Um, there doesn't need to be an audience for that. That's kind of 
sensitive. Um, so that's, that's very important to remember. Yeah, I mean, I think that things like that can happen. I had uh, a situation on set where we were filming in the forest and actors wanted to smoke. And it was a, you know, it was, it was a, a strict no-no in that particular, where we were. And, uh, you know, I just had to be respectful of them and, and speak to them, you know, in a respectful way. But I think it's also, I, I, you guys may disagree. I, I, for me, I don't think that the job of the producer is necessarily to be the friend of everybody on set. And I think that you are there for a purpose. You need to know what the, what the, um, what the goals are of your production. And uh, while you want to be respectful and kind to everyone, that it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily for the actor to, to like you at the end of the day and buy you a beer or anything, so. If, if an actor is talking on set, um, you know, I ask them to be quiet, or I tell Cora to ask them to be quiet. And um, if they keep talking, I ask them to be quiet again. And if they keep talking, I ask them to be quiet again. And you just have to be persistent and you know, not be afraid. I agree, you can't be everybody's friend, unfortunately. But also, um, I think, n not confrontational in a way that will um, turn the rest of the crew <coughs> against them. So it's a delicate balance. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not just actors, you know. It, you, this runs across all crew members too. So, and financiers who happen to be visiting set and don't really understand what the whole rolling thing means. And the girlfriends of financiers. Yes. <laughs> and the children of uh, We've been on the same set, I think. Um, <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Um, here's, here's a really practical question. Um, so, what's better for short, self-produced film? Do you rent the equipment or do you buy it online? I think they're specifically thinking about cameras. Um, and if you buy it outright, where are the good places to look? I remember seeing a filmmaker interviewed on um, a talk show who had bought a camera, made his movie, and then returned it within the 30-day <laughs> period. And I remember thinking, that stuck with me, yes, that was years ago. The Best Buy and restocking I remember just thinking fee. how ingenious that was. <laughs> um, I, I, we tend to rent our equipment all, always because, um, you know, to purchase equipment, the, the, the equipment's constantly being improved upon and there's new technology coming out all the time so to make an investment in in a piece of equipment is you know unless you really know what you're doing it's it and and you're you're using it a lot um, it may not be worth it but you know if you are looking you know a lot of people are shooting on 5d's and 7d's um, those are those are um, you know consumer cameras that that have video function that look amazing and they're you know, they're great for, for certain types of um, situations. If you need to be pretty stealth and you don't want people to see that you're filming and you don't have a permit, you know, those are, those are probably the kinds of cameras you're gonna end up using, so. I think in general, yeah, uh, ex unless it's that type of situation, um, I would also tend to rent, primarily because when you rent equipment, you have, um, well, first of all, if you just buy a camera to shoot a short, chances are your level of knowledge with that camera may not be expert, and you really don't want to have a lot of surprises come up on the day. You want to know exactly how the camera works. Um, and also, when you're in production, if you do have any problems, if you are renting from somewhere, like a rental house, they have a support team, and you know, if something's, something goes down, you go and you swap it out, or they'll send someone out. Um, and that just doesn't happen when you pick it up at Best Buy. So. In a lot of low-budget situations, uh, there are a lot of cinematographers that own cameras, and so sometimes it makes sense to work with somebody who owns their own camera if you have a really limited budget, um, and and that can that can be a huge uh, savings to your production. Great. On that note, <laughs> I think we've made it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.